Edgar Allan Poe was a master of the macabre, so it seems obvious that his own life would be filled with tragedy and heartbreak. Still, it might surprise you how tough he had it. This is the tragic, real-life story of Edgar Allan Poe. In 1809, a boy named Edgar Poe was born to two traveling stage actors. Edgar's father was David Poe Jr., who hailed from a military family so hardcore that David had to refer to his dad as General. Needless to say, those folks weren't exactly happy when Jr. fell in love with the talented thespian Eliza Arnold, nor when he followed her onto stage himself. After marrying, the couple had two sons, William and Edgar. The latter boy was named after a character in Shakespeare's King Lear, which the couple was performing at the time. Sadly, David wasn't a very good father. His struggles with heavy drinking, fighting, and financial hardship were stressful enough for the family, but he also resented Eliza's far more successful acting career. Eventually, he deserted his family, leaving Eliza alone to raise the children. Worse still, when young Edgar was just three years old, Eliza came down sick and died. Apparently, David died soon afterward, though the circumstances of his demise are hitherto unknown. Regardless, this left the young children with no parents and no safe place to go. Edgar Poe was soon adopted by the Allen family, hence the Allen part of his name. But while he got along well with his adopted mother, Frances, the same can't be said for his father. Poe's relationship with his new father, John Allen, proved to be a source of conflict, misery, and heartbreak for much of his young life. Allen was a wealthy tobacco merchant and wanted Poe to follow him into the family business. As a result, he wasn't exactly over the moon about Poe's love of the literary. Naturally, Poe rebelled, mostly by writing poems on the back of Allen's business papers. The relationship further soured as Poe grew older when Allen repeatedly refused to lend Poe money, leading to his gradual descent into destitution. For his part, Allen seems to have been remarkably dismissive of the boy's concerns. He once wrote Poe off as quite miserable, sulky, and ill-tempered, for example. He also liked to boast about his own generosity in paying for Poe's education, while refusing to actually pay for it at the same time. Not the kind of guy you'd want as a dad, that's for sure. When Poe was drowning in debt, starving, and receiving basically nothing from his so-called father, he turned to a truly last-ditch solution. Let me see your war face! Sir! You got a war face? Ah! That's a war face! Now let me see your war face! Ah! Yeah, that's right. Poe took the false identity of Edgar A. Perry, claimed to be a 22-year-old clerk from Boston, and signed up for a five-year stint with the U.S. Army. Oddly enough, Poe excelled in the military, but he hated it too. Before long, he was desperate for a way out and confessed his true story to his commanding officer. Miraculously, the officer was basically fine with letting Poe out early, on the condition that he make amends with his obnoxious adopted father. Unfortunately for Poe, Allen wouldn't respond to his letters, and it wasn't until Francis Allen died that the two men reconciled. Allen then finally agreed to let Poe leave the service early, as long as he enrolled at West Point, the United States Military Academy, which doesn't exactly feel like a win for poor Edgar. Still, Poe did what was asked, and actually excelled in his studies. When Allen remarried, however, he went dark again, and Poe decided he wanted out of the military for real this time. But he still needed Allen's express permission to leave, and Allen just wouldn't give it. So Poe solved the problem by flunking his studies, being as insubordinate as he possibly could, and purposely getting himself kicked out of West Point. Right on. Sarah Elmira Royster was Poe's first and final love. Unfortunately, the two never married, and their relationship hit more than a few snags along the way. Sarah and Edgar were childhood friends and neighbors, and became engaged as teenagers. When Poe left to attend the University of Virginia, the two star-crossed lovers went long distance, but everything came crashing down when Royster's father caught wind. He simply didn't want an orphan like Poe as a son-in-law, so he intercepted their letters and left both kids thinking the other was ignoring them. When Poe returned home, he found that she had married a wealthier man in his place. Based on this sad tale, many have speculated that Sarah may have been the long-lost Lenore mentioned in The Raven. Shall I ever hold again that radiant maiden whom the angels call Lenore? How the hell should I know? What am I, a fortune teller? Maybe that's not quite how it goes. Either way, their romance didn't end there. When Sarah's husband died in 1848, Poe reached out to her again and they rekindled their romance. His initial proposal was rebuffed, but a few months later she accepted. Those wedding bells never rang out, however, because Poe died just 10 days before the wedding. Despite Poe's magnificent talent and fierce desire for success, he spent most of his life in poverty, and his work was consistently undervalued. His first poetry collection, Tamerlane, was a financial disaster, which probably wasn't helped by his unwise decision to use the obvious pseudonym A. Bostonian. His second book, the imaginatively titled Poems, only got off the ground when Poe convinced his fellow army cadets to lend him money to get it running. 
Even when he was shopping for a publisher for his landmark poem, The Raven, one magazine not only rejected it, but actually gave Poe $15 in sympathy cash. When he finally sold the poem to the American Review, it netted him just $9. Fortunately, The Raven garnered Poe enough mainstream attention to eke out a living as a professional writer. In fact, he became something of a household name, gave lectures, and even ran his own magazine. But his personal life was a mess at the time. His wife Virginia was ill, and his finances weren't particularly sturdy. Even at the peak of his career, his annual salary totaled just $624, around 20 grand in today's money. As Poe struggled through his life, he increasingly began to rely on alcohol to support him. This problem only worsened during social situations, which often required Poe to keep up a good mood and therefore caused him no small amount of stress. The death of Poe's wife, Virginia, in 1847 didn't exactly help things either. While it's impossible to properly diagnose someone who lived over 100 years ago, it does seem likely that Poe was an alcoholic. But that's not really the whole story. The reality of Poe's very genuine suffering is often clouded by the false stories told by those who disliked him. His enemies often tried to paint him as a town drunk and a drug addict, neither of which was true. As far as drugs go, Poe only seems to have occasionally used opium for medical purposes, which was fairly common at the time. He certainly wasn't the inebriated ne'er-do-well that some people considered him either. In fact, we don't have much real evidence that he deserved the reputation he was given, which makes it so unfortunate that it lasts even to this day. Edgar Allan Poe was just 40 years old when he passed away, and although the premature nature of his passing is obviously tragic, the truth is, we don't actually know how or why he died. A week beforehand, his fiancée had expressed concerns about his health, and his doctor told him not to travel, but he did anyway. A number of strange lapses in Poe's behavior then took place, such as him being totally unable to find his luggage. He was later found sprawled in a gutter, wearing someone else's clothes, unable to move, and screaming out for someone named Reynolds. He died four days later. So what happened? Well, many at the time were quick to blame alcohol, but his attending physician disputed this notion. Various diseases have been suggested too, such as tuberculosis and brain lesions. But one of the most prevalent theories comes down to the fact that he was found outside a voting booth. The idea goes that Poe was the victim of cooping, a horrifying voter fraud scam at the time. Cooping occurred when corrupt politicians paid criminals to drug innocent bystanders, particularly homeless, and then forced them to vote at location after location, until some of them finally dropped dead. Sadly, the mistreatment of Edgar Allan Poe didn't let up after his death. His funeral was hastily conducted only a day after he died, resulting in just seven people attending, one of whom had nothing but harsh words to say about him. But we'll come on to that mess in just a minute. Initially buried in an unmarked grave, it took 11 years for Poe's cousin to purchase a real monument for him. Before the monument could be mounted, however, it was destroyed when uh, a speeding train came off its rails and crashed directly into the stone carver's place of business. Which... Okay, sure. In the end, it took nearly three decades before an assembly of students and teachers collected the funds to give Poe the monument he deserved. Except that wasn't the end, because his coffin then accidentally shattered to pieces during the transfer. Oh, come on. Oh no, God! No, God, please, no, no! It was around this same time that Poe's wife, Virginia, was finally interred beside him. Until that point, her remains had been placed in their landlord's family cemetery, which had subsequently been built over by developers. Since then, both of them have thankfully remained in their rightful place. Many of the darker Edgar Allan Poe myths that circulate today stem not from the writer's life, but from his obituary, which was penned by the Reverend Rufus Griswold. This not-so-holy man wrote the obituary under the pen name Ludwig, and he used it as a chance to portray Poe as being the drunken, drug-addicted, unsavory character that many still see him as today. As you might imagine, Griswold had a personal reason for besmirching Poe's legacy. Over the years, the two men had gone back and forth between being friends, enemies, and literary rivals, and Poe's public critiques of Griswold's work did not go forgotten. Now, these days, writers are generally advised to not get too antsy about bad reviews and criticism, but Griswold was such a bitter little man that he followed up his nasty, deceptive obituary with an equally nasty, deceptive book about Poe's entire life. Ironically, Griswold's portrait of Poe as a dark, disturbed figure ended up making his old enemy even more famous, while Griswold himself has become a mere footnote in literary history. Kinda feels like karma, don't you think? In life, Edgar Allan Poe never received the recognition he deserved. In death, however, he has been hailed as America's Shakespeare, and many of the lies that Ludwig spread about him have been publicly dismissed. There are whole museums and societies dedicated to Poe's life, and works like The Pit and the Pendulum and The Raven are routinely studied in high schools across the Western world. 
Perhaps the most impressive tribute to Poe's legacy, however, was the example set by an anonymous person identified only as the Poe Toaster. From 1948 until 2009, this masked figure rose from the shadows every year on the anniversary of Poe's birthday to leave a bottle of cognac and three red roses on the author's original grave. And who was the Poe Toaster? Nobody knows. They never sought fame or attention, even as an increasingly large crowd of onlookers began appearing to watch the annual ritual. It is now believed that the original toaster may have actually retired in 1999, passing the mantle down to their child. It's speculated that the end of this tradition in 2009 may have been due to an increasing amount of media attention on the toaster, whomever they may have been. Luckily, their work is today continued by the Maryland Historical Society, who every year send their own Poe toaster to pay their respects to one of dark literature's greatest champions. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.